I'll let you know when I see something, okay? Yep. Hey! Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm TQ with my brother JQ and our good friend Matthew Scholar. Hey, hey, uh, hey, hey. How you doing, Matthew? I'm great. I'm great. It's great to be with you guys here. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have your tea ready? I do. Actually, I need to pour it. Um, I've got this beautiful little teapot that my brother Jeffrey ga gave me when he got back from Vietnam many years ago. Nice. And I got my cool little gourd strainer that I got in Beijing about 10 years ago. Excellent. And so I'm going to pour some of this amazing oolong that you guys offered up. Thank you for that. That's our pleasure. Um, I was excited. Uh, I think you, Jay was saying you uh, describe oolong as your favorite tea. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm. That sort of makes sense. And I know we'll get into it, but I said, uh, doesn't surprise me that a, a, a guy who's knowledgeable in wines and cognac uh, also chooses oolong as his favorite tea. Um, seems to go right along. You're, you're a stereotype of the oolong wine, wine expert, uh, <laughs> cognac expert, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's the <laughs> it's the complexities um, of um, it's the complexities of the of the um, tea that actually, you, you know, you're really right. Do um, are very analogous to um, cognac, and and a big part of that is the wood, you know, um, and. Cognac is an oak age product and you get a really distinct wood flavor, especially from this one that you just um, gave me and um, some dried fruit as well, um, which in your older cognacs is really um, operative. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's really delicious. It, it is, is really delicious. delicious. I, love um, I mean, you've traveled quite a bit and you were telling me on your journeys uh, a few times about you've had some pretty rare oolongs and got to try some a bunch of different ones right yeah and um Very also popular in france right yeah i think so um yeah the tea is becoming more and more popular it's really um um not uh it's a niche thing in france um uh it's really a coffee culture so you know going into a normal cafe or brasserie it's lipton that's all you get and, yeah. um, and so bring your own. But um, if um, you are um, doing a, um, uh, a tea, they have these um, salon du thé, you know, these little um, tea shops and they've got all kinds of stuff. And, and so that's cool. But my um, greatest um, experiences were um, in Beijing, uh, Beijing, China. And so, um, and that's where I, I got my cool little teacup here. Um, nice, beautiful. And, yeah, and um, and the strainer, um, a um, an old Chinese woman gave me that strainer. As a matter of fact, that picture behind me is really cool. Let me get the mic out of the way. Yeah. Um, there is a young woman looking at her cell phone and her face is illuminated by the cell phone which I fell in love with that drawing. It was drawn by the same guy who drew my mentor Stokes, who's um, the guy right behind me. Um, and he, that's a hand drawing. Um, it's a print of a hand drawing by um, Tom, Thomas Wilson, who's an amazing draftsman and portrait drawer and ornamental blacksmith, actually. He's one of the greatest ornamental blacksmiths in the world. Lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but he was um, in China for over 12 years. and. Um, he drew that picture of, you know, um, their cell phone crazy over there, just like they are here. And yeah. um, so you you see that that illuminated face. And um, but um, while I was over there, I, I was um, treated to some amazing tea culture. Um, I got a couple of things to show you. Nice. Um, this is I love this show and tell. We've got so much to cover. This is great. Yeah, let me just see if I can grab this. 
And while you're doing that, I'm going to say what's up to Rita and Abdul are on the okay. call. Johnny Guana uh, is is live right with us right hey, now. Hey, Johnny. <laughs> Fellow blues man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, can I see comments anywhere here or no? You can't. We'll, we'll be narrating them for you. Awesome. Uh, just because it's hard to. So you just you just be entertaining for us and tell us. I will. Stuff and <laughs> I'll we'll do my that. best, brother. Yeah. <laughs> so here, here is my other favorite, which is Pu'er. Uh, and this, yeah. is, this is a beautiful disc of Pu'er. And, and one of the great things about Pu'er <laughs> is that you can um, age it. It's, it's, it's something that gets better with age. Yeah. And, so, and so here is a really old Pu'er and it's, it's wrapped in, um, in like a bamboo leaf and um, it's a it's bricked up and it probably had been buried in the ground for a few years it's it's over 20 years old now it was 15 years old wow. when i got it and um, that's been at least 5 years so it's over 20 years old and wow. um, so i'm Dude, we need to we need to we need yes. to have a that out. <laughs> yes. why would you do this I'm why would you do this stuff yeah <laughs> i'm saving it for um, my fellow tea lovers. So nice. let's, let's go crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, that's really cool. How uh, you been? Hold, how you been holding up, man? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've been um, hanging in here. Um, I, uh, you know, I've been uh, a professional musician um, gigging since I was 19 years old, and that's um, 30. That's 40 years, uh, 30, 39 years ago. And wow. this is the longest that I've ever gone without gigging by three times. Um, so maybe I've gone two or three weeks during that period of time at the most. I don't even remember that, but I'm, I'm sure it happened. Um, but um, so th there's that, uh, you know, and, um, and then there's all the things that we have to um, wrap our heads around, you know, no matter how long you've been in this world, you've never seen anything like this. And it is truly, um, uh, you know, uh, life changing, mind bending, um, uh, emotionally, really difficult. I think the not playing um, thing, I honestly f have been kind of paralyzed uh, by this and um, just I have to be honest about it. I have not, people think that this would be the moment to um, woodshed, um, which is a, a word us musicians use, as you know, um, uh, to practice and get into the basement and just sit in woodshed. And I haven't been able to do that. Um, but most recently I've gotten back into, uh, you know, I've challenged myself. I'm doing a live uh, Facebook broadcast um, tonight at six o'clock. I'm cool. doing this, and um, so you can tune in on my my page on Facebook, um, and I'm going to be, you know, singing, playing along to tracks, and 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 talking um, about uh, what's been going on a little bit. Are um, these tracks like from your albums that you've like doctored to make them like play? Yeah, along? these tracks are um, are. Uh, some of them are from my records, so it's just my my original just like mute tracks, your parts. the original tracks with the vocal and harmonica muted, and then in some cases the guitar solo muted so that I can blow over it. So yeah, you know, yeah, I I don't say play your guitar, man, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so. Um, uh, and then I have some other tracks which actually sound the best down in this room. Um, right now until I can figure out some higher tech um, uh, ways of um, doing this. Um, the, the I have these acoustic guitar. Um, actually, the guitar probably is not acoustic. It's, it's electric, but it's just a duo. So it's just a guitar track. And Tom Holland, my guitar player um, of late, has um, had laid these tracks now for me um, when I was working for um, uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs special events. I for seven years I was doing a um, uh, farmers markets in what they call the underserved neighborhoods, and um, uh, we're talking West Side and South Side. And so for seven years I'd go out and um, do these duos, and um, it was a beautiful model because these are what. Um, people refer to um, actually what is an official designation of a food desert. Yeah. 
which is stunning that that there's such an official designation that, in the richest country exists, on the planet. Right? You know, yeah. It, it's just, uh, it's just yeah. unbelievable. The richest country in the history of the world. Exactly. Has food, has food deserts in the second, third largest city in the in the country. In the country. Yeah. And, and yeah. if you drive, just take a ride down 76th Street um, from Racine, um, you know, heading south, and um, you will. Um, you will see acre upon acre upon acre of empty lots that could just be filled with food growing, you know. And um, up on 76 and Racine um, by the Anchor House, it's, which is like an old folks um, home, um, there's a big farm back there. And it was just an abandoned lot um, with broken up concrete. And they poured, um, you know, uh, tons of um, compost down and, and mulch and, and they planted all these vegetables. And a lot of those vegetables we sold out, out on the street. And I would play there. And, um, and each year, you know, the first year we had, um, you know, um, uh, a chef, um, who is from the hood, who, um, you know, would um, do these wonderful um, expositions of how not to destroy the nutrients in your food and these delicious dishes that would use all of the food that were, was available at the market at that day. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, Chef Coco, her name is, and she's a wonderful, uh, wonderful personality, great chef, really knowledgeable about food. And, um, and so she would do her thing and then I would be there playing and um, there was food that was grown in the neighborhood. Um, there uh, was, um, again, music that was grown in the neighborhood that actually, you know, evolved on the south and west sides of Chicago. Um, and um, there was, um, you know, uh, all this uh, wonderful produce and other things available. And so it was a great model. And, you know, we had security, we had the chef, we had um, all kinds of people hired to help us. And each year, the first year, no security. Uh, after the first year, no security. Second year, um, you know, there was um, no chef. Um, and, you know, pretty soon there was not even a tent available. And I was standing out there in the sun um so the last year which was last year they they gave me my regular amount of um gigs and um after we started the season they canceled 75 percent of my gigs which destroyed my summer financially they gave me no notice they just said oh we reallocated funds you know and so it really wasn't a priority they never really got the word out um to the community um, it was just sort of window dressing. I hate to say it, but um, but it was. And I'm hoping that somebody, um, there is a new uh, commissioner, uh, Mark Kelly, um, who I've personally written to, never got a response from, but I have 30 hours of footage. I would bring Jimmy Johnson, the 90-year-old uh, uh, blues guitar player, singer, legend, um, Lurie Bell, another legend, you know, um, great yeah. players like Tom Holland and Billy Flynn and Johnny Iguana, wonderful singers like Dietra Farr. Um, uh, we had uh, Tail Dragger out there. We had a, a roving blues festival, and I've got like 30... 35 hours of footage of it that I've offered to DK, so they've never accepted, you know, any of it. So long story, uh, short story long, um, I um, <laughs> I needed some, um, I needed some backing tracks that I couldn't afford to hire a musician. 75% of my income for that summer had um, disappeared. And wow. so Tom very, very um, generously went into a friend's studio and um, who recorded us um, for free. And uh, Pete Galanis, who's a great guitar player here in town. And, um, and we went in and we cut some. And so you'll hear, you'll, I, I think the tune I'm gonna do is gonna be from that. And, okay, cool, um, cool. Today. And, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, well, in that, in that just, case, let, let's get started with the song. Yeah. You want to hear some? Yeah. I would love to. Um, while you're getting ready, I just want to say again, TQ, JQ, T Time, and Merz Apothecary. We've got our good friend, uh, our brother uh, Matthew Scholler on. Big with bro, us. Sco. Max goes a, a a working blues musician, uh, among other things, but that's primarily a working musician, as he was saying, for the past 39 years. Uh, so, M Matthew, give them a little taste of uh, what they would get if they're going to see you live in a club 
and what they're going to get tonight when they go to your Facebook page to see you play live, which we will certainly link up. All right. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? All in first week. This is a living legend. Hey, T, mute you your own mic while he's playing. Okay. So, sure.
God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Matthew, that's the most joy. That's one of the most joyful moments I've had uh, since this whole pandemic began. Uh, oh, man. Thank, thank you, you for the reminder of how good it is to hear live music. Oh, my God. I know. Isn't that incredible? Oh. So how is the mix? I've been working on this. Yeah, it sounds, sounds, sound. it sounds really good. I, I gotta like, say. like I said, it sounds like lo- live and raw. It's like you're in yeah. my room. It's, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. awesome. I was say, when I heard you were playing, I was wondering how all it was, I was going to mix with the feeds and the different music, the, the audio sources. Yeah, like, it's how many more, how many more mics do we need? How many more? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> well, thanks to your baby brother, um, T, um, yeah. I, I, I got it together. He, he, he gave me the secret ingredient I needed, which is this microphone right here. And, yeah. um, and also taught me how to use some technology on the web that um, allowed me to um, uh, film myself doing it and, and play it back so that I could see how I was coming across. And, 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 and tweaking it was, you know, took a few hours, but um, it work, it's working out pretty good. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, it sounds great. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate hey, it. so I wanted to ask you, mm-hmm. I got a text from you the other day when we were setting this up. And I was in, in, delighted and surprised to hear you were on day eight. It must be like day 12 now of Plant Paradox. You're yeah. doing it, which yeah. is exciting. We talk about it a lot on this show. And we have uh, um, some people that watch this that are into that as well. So can you tell us about like your um, day three hump? Uh, can you tell you us? Ask, a, you had one? Yeah. Can you yeah, tell well, us, that, are you well, feeling the two week hump coming on as well? Cause there's usually my day, like, yeah. yeah. My day hey, Jay, three. can you switch it so we're all tiled right now? We are. Oops. Sorry. Well, let me put it back to directional, let's see. We are, you yeah. have to switch it for you, T. Yeah, I switched it. Okay, so um, yeah, dig, I, uh, <laughs> day three um, was actually day five because um, on day two, it was either day two or day three, I think it was day three. Um, Tina realized, my wife Tina realized that there was some olive oil in something we had eaten. And she was like, nope, we're starting <laughs> over again. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm supposed to get my glass of wine tomorrow night, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and she's like, nope, we're starting over again. So we did five full days of clean out. Um, wow. And, um, and, you know, zero zero alcohol um, for a guy in the beverage business. That's a, a, a feat. Um, yeah. and, um, for, for anyone, anywhere. That's yeah, <laughs> really, for these days, that's for sure. And, um, and quite honestly, I was doing my share of self-medicating, um, trying to deal with all of this, uh, um, this nightmare. And there's no other way to describe it but as a nightmare that we've all been um, living globally. And, and so many amazing um, things to wrap your head around that, that, that in a snap of a finger, everything could stop, you know, and that, um, and, and that it didn't just stop here, but it stops, you know, in, um, in, you know, where everywhere, you know, just in, everywhere. from yeah. Brazil to, to France to uh, Africa, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just a, a pandemic. And, yeah, when, um, when you were, when you mentioned wrapping your head around it, one of the things I, I I noticed was I knew that intellectually that it was happening happening everywhere, but I kept sort of finding myself in the first month and a half having daydreams of like, let's just pack up the girls and go to some place where we don't have to deal with this right now. And I'm like, yeah. oh wait, there's no place. It doesn't. There's exist. no place yeah. on the planet where we don't have to deal with it or won't have to soon. Right. You know? Exactly. And and so and and then we see. You know, amazing um, uh, uh, sort of um, you know not fallout, but a, a, amazing things that happen due to I think that kind of global um, um, uh, you know sort of this empathy we have for one another globally. I mean, um, when George Floyd was uh, killed, and and still. There, there are demonstrations like our demonstrations all, all over, over Europe, everywhere, you know, and, and I think there's a relationship there between how we all feel connected through um, this incredibly destructive negative virus, but that we all realize that 
there are no borders. There are no, um, you know, uh, the virus does not um, see borders. The virus does not need a the virus green card. doesn't have a passport, man. <laughs> right, exactly. And um, and and neither does um, air or water pollution or any of these things that make us a global village, you know. And so anyway, on yeah. the <laughs> on the third day, I had to go into the first day again, and then <laughs> so we we did five full days of clean out and I felt great and um, and then we started in on the, the regular regime um, and Which, to be clear for because what Jay mentioned yeah, yeah you can definitely eat olive oil you can have a glass of wine you can do all these things if you're following uh, sort of the lectin free plant paradox diet uh, it's just the clean out is sort of like an extra strict version to get you your baseline reset right I just right, you know, right. Those are pointing, I just want to yeah, my, my understanding is that those three days are um, to eliminate um, foods that feed the bad bacteria that um, it battles the good bacteria in your gut. And that um, by the time those three days are over, that bad bacteria is gone. And Yeah, it literally and takes three days to starve those out. And, starve them out, and, right. And when you do that, it's actually amplified by the fact that without having to fight the bad bacteria, your good bacteria is able to repair at an accelerated rate. Wow. So your mm. your cell walls of your intestines of your guts are then repaired so fast because you do that. And yeah. then they're able to sustain some mild inflammation due to eating animal products or whatever that does, right? right. But even then we're still still eating the most mild versions of those, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so what so what was like your favorite meal so far because like i think people think like you can't be decadent but like i mean fat is decadent and you can have a lot of fat on this diet you know yeah well i mean we've been we're really doing it for um you know um a lot of reasons but we're, we really are doing it for weight loss and um and i've already lost like um seven pounds and yeah. um and that's the first couple of weeks a lot of water weight and i've been hitting yeah. that that exercise bike hard and um combining the two things together is really um a good a good move and so uh but um my favorite um meal you know we cook really um simply over here for the most part um tina's got major chops cooking so um you know but um we have, um, you know, just some really, um, a, a really nice piece of um, wild um, salmon or um, uh, wild fish with um, some greens. Um, and she makes this amazing, um, um, is cauliflower on the diet? Yeah. 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 She makes this amazing cauliflower um, um mashed potato dish yeah and, yeah and and so it's it tastes just like mashed potatoes and so um having and that, it gives you that like comfort food it, satisfaction yeah. right? it tastes like potatoes i mean yeah. it's amazing and and so that but she got some noodles that were on the diet and she made a pesto um out of um you know um uh, basil and um, and I think walnuts and there might have been um, sure, not, I, don't, I don't think she even put cheese in it I yeah you don't need to actually yeah. no it was so just garlic good. olive oil yeah lemon. and yeah. she put scallops on top of it and um, and awesome oh my god I mean yeah. no you don't miss any listen and you get so hungry that a uh, chew would taste good so, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, <laughs> that is the quote of the day for sure. And then, and, and then you know, you think, well, I, I really need to drink at least that m my half bottle of wine that I get normally, you know. And um, but no, after that, for after you're you're cleaned out of the alcohol and you hit that one glass of wine, you got a pretty good buzz going, man. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, Teresa's um, saying she's actually on day three. So, and day three for me, it, hang in there, darling. She, yeah, she says she needed that music to reset her mood. So thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, when Greta did it for the first time, she was just like, 
just walk around like yeah. just furious you know it's like yeah what, and, Greta's, like, Greta's even keel. and i would have this like extreme i get this like headache on one side behind my eye and i'm like uh here we go again you know but each time i do it because i try and do it two three times a year and you know yeah it, it's mm -hmm. like it gets easier and easier and the and the pain is only now hours long as opposed to a full day or two you know the first wow. day that it happened the first time i did it i actually had debt debt my dad goes to see gundry you know and so i had him call their office and find a doctor here because i thought i thought something was wrong with me <laughs> wow like, and so what do you attribute that headache to I, I I think it's like your bad bacteria punishing you. Yeah, I mean, I think if the die off is that, you know, they know that you, even when the days of just doing fastings, right? It's like you have this time where essentially you, there's like a next generation that's trying to survive. And there's just sort of like, you're dealing with the waste excretion product of these living organisms that are basically punishing you mm -hmm. or not get, that's the thing for not giving them what they want. And I think that's the thing that for me is the most powerful part about it. That's really hard to get across. And I always talk about this whenever we discuss it, Matthew, and I don't know if you feel this way. It's like, I described myself for 20 years as someone who needed sweets after a meal. And I, I was just like convinced that it's Your me. body was telling I'm you. I'm different than you may not need it, but I need it. I'm just that guy. And when I sort of realized, oh no, it's my certain bacteria strains in my gut that are basically controlling my mind to make me think me and them are the same. You know, like I, I am the, that we're the same, right? Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. And so that you, sugar is what they live off of. They live off of it and yeah. they do control your mind, right? We know about the gut mind axis. There's a straight mess. There's the most messaging is connected from the gut to the brain. Wow. So you cannot say that they're not that what goes on in your gut does not control your mind. It, that's a that's a lie. That's right. demonstrably a lie. In so, fact, eight in fact eight times more from the gut to the brain than the brain to the gut. So yeah, it's not wow. like your brain controls your gut. Your gut controls your brain. And those. Very interesting. Those it's funny that it, it's funny that when people say like I just knew it in my gut. It's like, yeah. they're not joking. Like right. that is actually right. the center, right? Yeah. That's when you know a, de a decision is the right one when you do it with your gut. You and, know, and your brain's also, getting in the way. <laughs> all of the, all of these sort of diets that you talk about, you know, that, that we've talked about from, you know, wheat belly to this thing, they all talk about um, how uh, cravings and urges disappear after a while, after those things that are controlling your mind are eliminated, you know, and, and then once you go back to them, um, that uh, you, you know, um, start to crave them again, um, in, in a big way. And, and I, um, I am not a sweet guy. I've, we've, I've never been a, um, a dessert. You're a very dude. sweet guy. Um, I disagree. <laughs> no, no, he's, he's a bit salty. He's a bit and, salty. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I don't, you know, I don't crave sugars that have not been converted into alcohol. And um, yeah. so my sugar intake is is the digestif, the the, the cognac. Um, some Pasquet 04 here. The cognac after dinner is what I'm accustomed to. And, yeah. Um, and so um, consequently, when I stop drinking, even if I'm not on a uh, a Gundry diet or, or um, you know, any kind of eating regime, I'm just cutting out the alcohol. I crave sweets yeah, because yeah. really it's just, it's just sugar. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, what, um, if people want to, um, you have, uh, you're an interesting Renaissance man. And so I just want to make sure we touch on everything that in, mm -hmm. in case people are interested um, obviously we've shared the link for your show tonight and they can follow your Facebook page, uh, and all that, but yeah, I want do it, to people, do it, please do it. I'll be on the kids. We're all going to watch. It's going to be great. Oh, cool. Um, great. so, uh, but I wanted to know, um, if they wanted to find your cognacs, Matthew is a cognac, weirdly exporter, not an importer. Most well, people actually from... it's changed. Yeah. It's changed. Yeah. Um, what is it now? Um, we are now, I am now, we, I partnered with these guys here in, yeah. in So in you are both, exporter, so, import. Yeah, kind of, no, I mean, we're just importers now. Um, the, the, 
the family tradition cognac France still exists, but um, we take care of certain things internally in France that need to be taken care of. But we're 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 actually exporting uh, importing directly from the producers right now. Okay, uh, and so um, um, we're working with High Road Spirits. And you can go to highroadspirits.com and go to the French portfolio and find um, most of our portfolio on there. Um, and um, we've partnered with these guys who are just amazing. It's an incredible um, company that um, the prerequisite of the company is that the spirits that they um, uh, sell are all family made. It's got to be family made. And so we've got the sickest mezcal, soto, and tequila portfolio from this beautiful brother named um, Ishmael Gomez, um, uh, Leica Imports. So that's in the Mexican portfolio. Um, the 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 big um, and your brother drive... Larry has the personal relationship. He lives in Cognac, right? Oh yeah. Well, Larry right. lives in Cognac. We've had personal relationships with our producers who are all families, single vineyard grower Cognac. So you guys, this is. I just want like people to understand that this yeah. is like first of all, every country in the world makes a spirit from from grapes, and it's Everywhere, like yeah. grappa, uh, you know, um, rakia uh schnapps brandy all of these things are the same spirit and it it is the very best in armenia and france right am i wrong to say that armagnac armagnac uh, and cognac and, right? and cognac are both regions in france and um and yeah i mean it's generally considered the greatest brandy on the planet and um, and this is the greatest of the greatest because you're getting absolutely. single vineyard stuff right yes and it's really rare to get truly single vineyard stuff. You're, you're going to see a lot of people posing as single vineyard products, but they're really big industrial products who buy their grapes or their eau de vie, eau de vie, water of life, which the is juice. the distillate. It's the distillate that comes out of the still that's clear before it's hit um, any oak. And, um, and so, and those are schnapps, basically. That's what you know, yeah. you're talking about, or we call it eau de vie. The Germans call it schnapps, the French call it eau de vie. Um, and um, we- um, Would that be grappa in, in, in Italy? Well, gra grappa is a little grappa different. Be well, grappa is a little different because it's made from skin, seeds, um, um, of the grapes, um, so it's a it's a, got a little bit of different makeup to it. Um, it's gotcha. a, it's, okay. and it's got it's, a little more gas. Yeah, it's got some complexity to it for sure. <laughs> um, but it's also young, and they don't age it um, in yeah. oak the way that they do. I mean, the, the incredible thing about cognac, and I could talk about this for um, you know two days um, on here. But um, the incredible thing about cognac is that um, all of these different um, elements. Uh, occurred that created a perfect storm to make the greatest brandy in the world. And part of it is the fact that from the 1200s on, there was a um, trade mentality um, in that area because you had the Charente, which is the region that Cognac lives in. Um, and there's a river called the Charente River, which is a very, very um, uh, uh, calm and beautiful, welcoming river. And so it's very easy to get um, onto that river and, and take it to um, La Rochelle, um, which is an uh, hour and, and, and change from uh, Cognac. And that's a port town um, where so much of the um, exporting of everything, primarily at, at first it was salt, it was the salt trade. And, uh, and then in the 1600s, they started to make um, cognac. And it's interesting how that happened. Um, the Norwegians were buying um, wine from that area, which they, they liked, and, um, but it wasn't great wine and it wasn't very stable. And they um, would buy the wine and they would take it back to, um, I'm sorry, it's not the Norwegians, it was, it was the Dutch. And they take it back to Holland and, um, and it was spoiled by the time they got there. So they would make alcohol out of it. They distill it and they'd give it to the sailors to drink. And um, somebody had the bright idea. Well, wait a minute, let's distill it before we 
carry it because we'll be carrying one tenth of the juice. <laughs> so they started. They started opening up distilleries on the um, on the um, you know shores of the Charente, and um, and that's that's sort of how cognac started. But the other part of it was that those vessels that they carried it in, um, which were just vessels to carry it in, um, were made out of oak barrels. And um, one, at a certain point in history, um, there was an embargo, you know, the, that part, that Aquitaine, that part of France, that Western part of France changed hands between the British and um, the French um, many times over, you know, um, uh, centuries. And so um, the, uh, there was um, a, an embargo and um, the, the, um, British seized a ship that was filled with cognac barrels and it stayed out on the water for almost a year. When they got it back, they tasted the cognac and suddenly they saw this gorgeous golden color. And, so <laughs> it was, it, and then realized there was all these amazing flavors like vanilla and cedar um, that were being imparted into the eau de vie from the barrels. And so it was a kind of um, discovery through, through accident. But about another hour in the other direction, I think um, southeast of, um, um, I could be wrong, could be not, I can't see it in my head right now, but about an hour away from Cognac is Limoges, where they make the, the beautiful um, pottery. And, um, but there's a, a forest there, a natural oak forest there. And that's um, the wood that they um, sourced. And it's called limousine oak. Um, and so limousine oak <laughs> is the, and we can, we, there's also Tonsaise, which is a different kind of oak, um, different grain to it and all of that. But um, it, it, that's preponderantly what they use is, is limousine oak. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting set of circumstances that led to created, this particular spirit, led right? to this amazing yeah. um, uh, cognac and, and all kinds of things happen as it ages. Um, and it's a very fussy thing to make. It has to be very, very um, precise and really, really clean and really well done. So consequently, there's a lot of terrible artisan cognac out there or some terrible con uh, because the skill set is is unbelievable. I mean, these guys yeah. have to be farmers. They've got to grow grapes. They've got to harvest the grapes. They've got to make wine from the grapes. They've got to... Um, then distill them twice um, and um, then age them and then blend the different ages and then bottle them. And so wow. it, it's, a, it's, you know, um, and then, you know, if you isolate the different skills, it, there's all kinds of, I mean, the heat, they're uh, the Pasquets, Jean-Luc Pasquet, um, who is our mentor in this and who has um, a totally organic cognac. This is a four-year-old, um, four and five-year-old assemblage um, uh, called L'Organique uh, 04. And um, this is um, um, all of his um, products are, um, all of his grapes are biodynamically grown um, and, and certified wow. organic. So, you know, they, they, it's super labor intensive. They don't um, use herbicides. They do a lot of um, tilling and weeding. They um, don't, um, they plant barley um, uh, for simple sugars and um, fava beans for nitrates every two rows to replace the, uh, to replenish. Yeah, the replenish the soil. Yeah. I, I want to interrupt you for a second because as you're talking about this amazing skill set, um, one of the things I always think about and I think about teaching my kids is sort of, you know, in a world of specialization, and as we get, you know, expertise being passed globally, um, one of the things that we can do as we look at what we want to do is combine two areas of expertise to become an expert in this combination area. And as you're talking, I was thinking, um, not only do you do that, like you are a legitimate top of like world-class expert as a blues musician, harmonica player, and you are a world-class expert in cognac like legitimately the top of the, you know, the top of the heap. But I then that I, know too, I can guarantee you are the number one blues cognac expert in the history of the world. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of teasing you, but I also think it's true, Matt. Like Matthew, that's, you are like, you are 
you you're a top two heaps, and then you created this new one that, you know, uh, I don't know that the people are calling on the streets for the blues cognac experts, but you are the number one guy in the world in that. And I think it's always cool to like think about for anybody what they're better at than anybody else in the world, and you are. I well, just thank you. I, yeah, 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 no, thank you. I, I, you know, I just follow my um, my my love, you know, and. Um, um, my my primary love was music, and I found myself in 2001 um, uh, hired to uh, play the Cognac Blues Festival, which is called the Blues Passions Festival. And I went there with my band, and we we played a, a small little room um, on the festival grounds at one o'clock in the morning, or, or uh, it was about yeah. midnight, and. Um, and we had a line out the door. I'd been going there for a long time, playing since 1984. And um, so I had, you know, and, and, and the people who put the festival on didn't really realize um, that I had pretty good following in France already. And um, so they invited us back the next year to play the main stage. And I brought Little Smoky Smothers and John Primer with me. Um, and my brother, in the meantime, um, hooked up with a woman who is one of the administrators um, and volunteers for the festival, and she was assigned our band and uh, paid particularly um, close attention to my brother. <laughs> and, um, and they became a couple and um, then married and um, have a beautiful 17 year old daughter now. Um, wow, 17. Julia. 17. Yeah. I know she's two years yeah. older than Safi. That's yeah. amazing. Yep. And, I remember um, in like two two houses ago being at a house party with you and meeting her for the first time. Well, She's you know, little, little thing, little thing. Well, the little thing is now a basketball star. And, really? Um, yeah. She's, <laughs> he's Larry's mini me. Um, Larry was a baller from um, four years old on and awesome. was a killer basketball player and um, physically and intellectually and um, really, really knows the game. And so he, um, he, he taught her and she, um, we'll put, I'll put it this way, there is a designation for very special players in France um, called Les Espoirs, the hopefuls. And um, it's only given to people that they think can, can go pro. And um, and so she she moved to Limoges, where the, the barrels are made um, to go to a um, to be part of a basketball league that you know, in France, the basketball leagues are not part of the school. Um, so she went there. They found a really wonderful lycée for her. And um, so she's um, in um, she's in this very top league. And within that league, she is one of Les Espoirs. So she, awesome. she is, yeah, she is, I mean, her, her ball control, her body control, her, um, as my brother puts it, her basketball IQ is off the charts. And so That's she so really cool. runs the court, you know. Hey, Matthew, before we have to wrap it up, can we get mm -hmm. one more little, little sum sum? Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, I want to do that. And then we'll finish up at the end with just a shout out about how people can support uh, you and your work and do all that. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, definitely check out highroadspirits.com. Yeah. We linked um, it up. We post it <laughs> we linked up. it up. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, because that's, uh, that's a very, that's been sustaining me. Those are some, those are my, my brothers as well. They're great cats. And if you're into spirits, look, your father's day is coming up, right? Exactly. It's a great I mean, time. The, their driver products are these Japanese whiskeys, and um, and uh, they've just uh, blown up. Actually, they, and like really, when you really put well. it in perspective, like how much of a skill set goes into like a single bottle of single vineyard cognac? Yeah, it like actually seems really, really inexpensive to me. Ten bottles of wine in one bottle of cognac. I mean, just that right there. Just that alone. <laughs> let alone the labor, right? And then well, the and wine costs two dollars and eighty-five cents. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the and the storage costs. And I say storage because you're aging this. It's got to be aged years. a minimum of two years just to be called cognac. But most of it is aged 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. You know. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so when they like, make these assemblages, um, mm -hmm. I'm butchering the word, but is it um, you have to 
you have to designate it by the youngest year that goes in? Yeah, I mean, you actually can't really designate it at all. The, the but they 04, do. Yeah. yeah, they do. There's that, that 04 that's on there is just sort of um, slipping it in, you know. But um, yeah. but uh, they don't really give age statements. And VS is a minimum uh, of two years. VSOP is a minimum of four years. Okay. XO was a minimum of six years until 2018. Now it's a, a minimum of 10 years. So we don't even use those designations because they tend to undervalue our cognac. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so we, we, we create names for them. And um, so. Cool. All right. I'm so what's our to, last let's, song? Let's hear some blues to take us out. All right. Um, what do you want? You want it funky? We can do something yeah. funky. All right. Let's keep it funky. Put them on the screen. This is uh, my band, actually. How's that? Yeah. These kind of blues, an old Junior Parker tune, the title cut of my second to last record. Turn it up a little bit. Thank <laughs> you. 
and stop my leg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, man. <clears throat> um, Matthew, I, you know, I know we over the years have had the pleasure of getting uh, a bit emotional together uh, and sharing our love directly, but I just want to say thank you uh, for all the joy you've brought to me, my brother, my family, our friends, uh, and to Chicago and the world. Uh, I never, never get tired of hearing you play. Uh, it's really thank you just so the Yeah, best. man. You're the best, dude. Thanks well, for coming on. And also, like, thanks for being, like, a mentor to me in this whole music and life and being there for me. Uh, it's been almost 20 years now. Um, and when you met me, I was a, I was a real shorty you know um yeah yeah with with huge huge ears and huge huge skills and um you know you guys um have uh, i'll put it this way it's a totally symbiotic um relationship um you guys have um enriched my life and informed me on so many different levels and um the the soulmanship is off the charts. So yeah. love you, love you guys, love and you. thank you so much for having yeah. me. It was wonderful, and we, we'll do it again. I'm also going to be starting uh, uh, um, a video cast thing, um, and I'm going to be um, interviewing you guys too, Jay. I want to um, feature some of the remixes that you've done um, sure. with yeah. my music that are brilliant, and um, you know your your work as um, an actor, as a DJ, as a beatboxer, um, all of those things. You talk about um, Renaissance man. Um, you, you that stuff is off the hook, man. And, <laughs> Thanks, and, and I still want you to teach me how to beatbox. Well, you know, we were listening <laughs> to Junior Wells the other day on T's porch, on T's back porch, and man, he is yeah. beatboxing all over that record. I, I know. Well, that's right. He's using those techniques that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. and, I mean, and, sometimes that's louder than the sound of the heart. No, I know. Oh, yes. Purposefully, clearly. Yeah, purposefully, he's yeah. doing it on, on purpose for sure. And uh, yeah. and T, thank you so much for your guidance with all of this nutritional stuff and the amazing teas and um, uh, this whole plant paradox thing is really a life changer for us. We, uh, you know. I was getting so emotional at like, you know, a feather would fall in front of me and I'd start crying. You know? it's, like, it's like, what the fuck? You know, and, and, and there's a lot of people who are experiencing this and, and I don't call it a symptom of mental illness. It's not, it's a symptom no. of being human and, yeah. um, and being in the middle of a, uh, uh, something that we don't really understand as uh, well, something we don't understand on the pandemic and something we do understand on uh, the racism in our society that Absolutely. is, uh, you know, right is righteous and needs to be addressed, uh, and also is just hard not to make you physically enraged, and that, and, and you know, it affects everything. Uh, so Absolutely. physically and mentally, like sort of swept up with rage right. and frustration and all of these things that are legitimate. That's and not mental illness. Yeah, that's human. It's human, and 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 it's it's all as far as I'm concerned, it's all one virus, and um, and you know um, we we haven't um, we have so much to talk about, and and we're we're you know sort of in a, an escapist mode, but um, you know I'd like to dedicate all of this to George Floyd and his family, um, who was buried the day before yesterday, and um, and uh, tonight I'm going to be speaking out a lot about um, some of these. Um, uh, hor horrific things that we have witnessed and that are part of the history of this country. Uh, we'll be dealing with that tonight. But thank you guys cool. so much for, for having thank me. Thank you, Matthew. Everybody, if you have, don't follow Matthew Scholler, S-K-O-L-L-E-R. I know we're linking it up. Go find him on your favorite social media <clears throat> platform. He's going to be performing live tonight on Facebook. So please check it out. Uh, support our working artists. You know, Matthew is retailer. We're both working guys. I mean, we're, we're lucky. We're fortunate. We have uh, a lot of good blessings and privileges we have in our lives. But one of the things that I think you and I have always connected on is that like, you still got to, you're still hustling out there, working for your next customer, working for your next <laughs> gig. Uh, I, mine isn't the same kind of art, but I've always felt like uh, the three of us and a lot of our friends, it's a recognition of a certain I'm type a of work. That, yeah. Yeah. yeah right? It's a certain type of work. So support your local businesses, support your local artists. That's what I'm trying to say. Right on. All right, Thank peace, y'all. All right, All right. love you, brother. Peace.